So it is 11.01, let's get started. Memorial Day is just a couple of weeks away, which I, I can't even believe I just said that. I don't know where the year is going, but this is our 38th real estate chat. We do these periodically every month or two, always on a Thursday at 11 a.m. with some of the top New York City real estate experts in New York City. We have one main goal to help everyone suss out what is happening right now in the New York City real estate market. And as we know, there's thousands of mini markets, so there's no right answer here. And by piecing together all of these data points from these top experts, perhaps you can get an information edge. Uh, of, often, the information gleaned from these calls appears in, in like the New York Times and, and media reports uh, months from now. For example, famously, uh, our panelists called the bottom of the market. Yes, right after COVID, months and only months later did it become common knowledge. So basically, it all starts right here on this call. And in addition to some of the finest real estate agents the city has to offer on this panel, we also have Noah Rosenblatt with us today. He's the founder of Urban Digs, an amazing data analytics platform, a market insights platform as well, which many real estate agents subscribe to. We also have John Pascarello, a mortgage banker with US Bank, who's been doing mortgages for 20 some odd years, and he's worked for almost every bank. So he has a very pro a broad perspective on things. And I'll also be introducing a new panel member, Dan Morello, who I'm very excited about. I'll introduce him later on. And I hope he Yay, becomes a, <laughs> I hope he becomes a permanent fixture. So uh, just a reminder before we get started, if anyone wants a recording of these chats or notification for future chats, just click on that link above our faces. You'll see like a little just just basically pop your email address in there and I'll make sure that you get a link to this call, to the recording of it, as well as any future calls. And about me, uh, my name's Phil. I'll be hosting today. I've been a licensed real estate agent for 19 years, and I'm also the founder of Lease Break, which was founded in 2013, which is a free marketplace for shorter leases in New York City. We also have this groundbreaking lead program for agents where agents can get renter leads and get exclusive listings from tenants who are breaking their leases, uh, as well as work with renters searching for apartments. Phil, I'm so, so anyway. sorry, Philip, excuse me. I did, it's been 10 years, congratulations. Attention oh, yeah, must thanks. be paid, 10 years, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Actually, yeah, we should have done something for that. I mean, it just kind of passed right by, Tracy. You know? It's never Amazing. too late to celebrate uh, your 10th anniversary, Philip. <laughs> and, and you know what, it was May, it actually was May of 2013 as well. So it's, it's kind of interesting, um, which is my birthday month. Anywho, thank you, Tracy, for that. Uh, so let's get started. If everyone can pull to refresh their screen, so basically just use your thumb to refresh the screen just to make sure we're all looking at the same order. And we usually start first, so we'll eventually get to Scotty and then Dan, but we usually start first with Noah Rosenblatt, the founder of Urban Digs. Like I said earlier, it's one of the, um, it's, it's a great market insight and data analytic platform. And Noah's one of the city's top real estate data experts. So he's gonna give us a lay of the land from a data perspective before we turn to the agents. And as he'll acknowledge himself, real estate data is always a little behind given the nature of how long it takes to close on a property. So this is why we have his perspective as well as the agent's perspective. Agents have more of a on the ground, finger on the pulse type of perspective, which is so critical. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Noah, let's uh, hear from you. I'd love to know, I guess, what, what you're seeing out there right now. Uh, we're almost through the spring market. How do you think 2023 is shaping up? Uh, where are we today versus where we should be? You, you usually like to give that statistic. I'd love to know about yeah. uh, that in terms of volume and inventory. And if you have any thoughts on the rental market too, we'd love to hear it. Yeah. Um... Thank you. Always great to be here um, with this with this wonderful crew. Thanks again for having me. Um, interesting market. I mean, we're doing okay. We're doing well. I mean, March March was a very good month. March was like you know how we all, all envision um, the the record seasonal market of March, April, and May. Um, we had a lot of deals get signed, and it was looking really good. You know, April eh, April kind of cooled off a little bit. I mean, it 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 came in it came in much lighter um, than we should. 
Um, we booked about 850 contracts in April. We should have been over a thousand. Um, I believe we booked about, let me go check a look at the data right here so I can give you exact numbers. Um, we booked about um, 1160 deals in March. So just to give you an idea that March was, March was really hot. April cooled off a little bit. Um, and then now I'm looking at the data right now and we're bumping right back up. Now we're below where we're supposed to be when I look at the trend, right? So right now I look at the monthly trend, the 30 day deal volume trend, we're in a high 900s, about 970 or so. We're supposed to be about 1,080 for this month. So we're coming in light, but you know, considering everything that's going on outside macro, the Fed, inflation, the debt ceiling, all this kind of stuff, you know, it, it, it's it's not bad when you look at what we were doing November, December, and January. We were, we were quite slow. So yeah, the bottom was November, December, and early January. We had an amazing recovery. Um, I think that recovery lost a little bit of steam in April, but it's coming back right now. If you ask me about negotiability, 5% is where I see negotiability stats right now. That's probably lagging. That's probably more representative of deal signs in February or so, um, maybe late January, February, early March. Um, when I look at supply, we're up, we're up in supply, but you know, when I look at, look at it on an absolute level and it kind of you know, relate it to history, we're, we're like in a neutral area, a neutral slash tight area of supply. I mean, it's not, we don't have a lot of inventory out there. And I look at the last few cycles in the last couple of years, just to give you an example, you know, we would peak out at 7,700 units in the last, um, the last two cycles in the spring cycle of last year. And then the fall cycle of last year, we're at 7,390 right now. So we're below that. So I don't see inventory as restrictive. The rental market is extremely strong. I see very high price levels, record price levels. I see Crazy. inventory tight. Yeah, it's it's just that's supporting the market. Negotiability rates are at a nice solid level. They've been coming down since November and December, which again was the bottom. Demand is at a good level. It's not it's not strong, but it's also not weak. It's in a neutral level. And this market's just chugging along until until macro and the Fed and equity markets, I guess, dictate which way we go from here. Hey, Noah, I know this is hard to answer and it may be a question that's better for the agents, but do you get the sense that the reason why the volume is cooling, let's just say, is just because of inventory issues? You know, it's just because obviously if there's less volume. Sometimes the reason could just be, well, buyers are having a hard time finding properties, right? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it could be that. I tend to think it has something to do with what happened in mid-March um, with the Fed rescuing the banks and providing liquidity. And we had a little bit of a, a capital flight, uh, money of a store's, store value kind of thing and going through people's heads. I think there was a delayed reaction. Anytime there's something that happens in real time, it takes two to three to four weeks to really show into our markets. So something happened in mid-March kind of got a little hairy for the third week of March, that kind of hit us in early and a bit of April mm. type of thing. And I think now you're seeing the fact that everything's kind of recovering past it and we're not really having a liquidity banking crisis anymore. Right, so right. it could also be the fact that inventory is tight, um, but I'm sure there's aspirational sellers out there that are just not interested in selling it today, at, at prices the market are produced today. Right, awesome, awesome, thank you. And I'm sure we'll come back to you, Noah. As we as we go, there might be some more questions. So let's move now to some of the top agents to get their take. Uh, also, like last time, I'm going to ask the agents to give me a number between one and ten, with one being the strongest buyer's market they've ever seen, and ten being a raging seller's market. I think that helps put things in perspective instead of us just saying like, "Oh, it's good and it's bad," um, and that can kind of help us track also when we do this from time to time. So, uh, Scotty. I'd love to uh, hear from you and what you're seeing right now. Yeah, absolutely. What Noah said, spot on. The rental market's insane. I've definitely been on the streets for the rental, both representing um, the high-end renter's side, but also the landlord's side at a bunch of different levels, from like lower end to higher end. It's been insane, the amount of traffic. Um, every rental I've had has closed within three days, I think. So it's been, and it doesn't matter the price level. Um, I will say this, I think we're at a, uh, I, 
I said before, I think we're at like a five or six I had mentioned, but I think we're at a seven um, mm. in terms of a little uh, towards the seller side. I'm see, I'm out there with buyers, which I was not out there with uh, maybe five months ago or so, but the buyers are definitely looking that I have. They've adjusted to the rates that are going on psychologically. They're seeing more inventory, so they're getting excited about getting out there. But when we get out there, you know, 50% of the things that they want to see are already have accepted offers and contracts out in, within the first two weeks. So I'm definitely seeing it's uh, definitely edging towards the seller's side. And um, I think that's where we're at currently. And people are waiting for the next things to come to the market. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scotty. So let's now move on to Dan Morello. So Dan, Dan, Dan. I wanted to welcome Dan Morello to the stage. He's a new a new panelist, whom I hope uh, I hope will join us more in the future. Many of you know and love Dan. He's a senior managing director at Compass, but he's been a senior managing director for more than 15 years at other large brokerages, and he's been in the business even longer than that. So he brings a wealth of knowledge and a very broad perspective. And I'll also mention that this I didn't know until I guess maybe a few months ago that Dan is also the owner of at least for F45 training studios in New York City, which I think is just such a such, such, such a cool thing to add to your resume. Um, anyway, such a great guy. Uh, Dan, welcome to the stage, and I'd love to know what you're seeing out there in the New York City real estate market right now. And thanks, Phil, for the uh, plug. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, so on, uh, you know, sort of Noah's, um, on, the, on the heels of Noah, yeah, obviously we had nine months of below below uh, historical average months, you know, starting last June. Uh, we thought we were out of the woods when we had a great March. Um, and then obviously we were down probably about 20, between 25 and 30% in terms of contracts month over month into April. Um, obviously uncertainty doesn't do markets well. So we saw people in, you know, beginning to mid April literally just pause to see what was happening with the banking crisis. So I would say um, April was probably a four in terms of a market. And I think I'd have to agree with Scotty. We're probably somewhere in a six right now in Manhattan and a 12 in Brooklyn, um, <laughs> down from a 15. So we're starting to see parts of Brooklyn cool off, but still, you know, instead of 10 offers, we're having four offers come in. Wow. Um, the, the rental market is insane with really no uh, relief in sight. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Hopefully we are full steam ahead without any other bad news down the line. I still think there's a ton of pent up demand, but there's just been so much uncertainty over the last couple months. Um, I uh, actually will probably roll the dice and say that we may not have a, a seasonal July and August this year. We actually may see a busy July and August, especially if we have any sort of downward momentum on, on rates. Um, I still think the demand is there. Hmm. Thanks, Dan. And Dan, I know you've also seen, we have, we have some agents that do have some experience in rentals. Like I know you also do, and obviously you're a managing mm -hmm. director. So you see it, would you say this is the worst rental market for renters you've ever seen, or have we seen this before? I'm, I'm just kind of curious like where, put, where we put this in context to other really strong rental markets, especially in the summer where I remember some August when I was an agent, it, it was just insane. Like there was like literally nothing. I mean, how, how would you compare it to some other crazy rental markets that we've had? I, I mean, I can't really compare it to anything. I mean, it's literally the worst I've ever seen in, in 22 years. Wow. Um, th there's just no inventory when things are coming on the market. I mean, I'll give you an, I have a building, I still manage a portfolio of about 35 buildings. And I mean, their vacancy as of last month was a hundred, they have a hundred, no vacancies. And now we're starting to see them come up in, um, in June, you know, May, June, I'm starting to see them come up. And, you know, we were getting pre pandemic, oh, there's a building on 19th street. We used to get $4,200 for two bedrooms. We just rented one for 6,000. Wow. And, and we rented it in one day. Yeah. So no OPs at all now, right? Um, I wouldn't say no OPs. I think that also is dependent on location. I mean, you still see possibly certain things on the Upper East Side, possibly some things in the financial district. It's really, but for the most part, the majority of the market, you don't really need an OP. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, just, Dan. Just me, I want to clarify, Philip. Uh, OP yeah. means that the owner is paying the broker's fee. In almost all cases here, if you're a renter, you are paying the broker fee here. I just want to make that clear for people that don't know. Thank you, Scotty. Yeah, we need that context. Uh, thank you, Dan, so much. Uh, let's move to Naomi. Again, congrats on the move to Corcoran. And Thank you. would, would uh, love to hear your thoughts on the market. And don't forget to give us your number in terms of how strong you think the sales market is. So I'm also leaning towards number six only because I do see a demand. Uh, what's concerning me is the how many co-op turndowns there have been, uh, mm -hmm. more so than ever. Like I've spoken to quite a few. Um, I mean, personally, I had a turndown and colleagues in my office have had turndowns. And I've spoken to attorneys who say that their volume of signed contracts has been really strong, but they've never seen so many co-op turndowns as they have in the last, um, let's say, uh, 45 days or so. So that to me is concerning. What's the um, reason for that, Naomi? You know, what are you attributing that to? You know, obviously they don't tell us why they turn down uh, buyers. Um, I think sometimes, uh, or, or in this case, it just might be the price. You know, the prices are lower than they have been. And I think co-ops are like, well, we're not going to put it on our, you know, we're on our building because then it's going to become a trend and they don't want it to become a trend. Um, I've had co-ops on the market for over a year with really no uh, offers. And then condos, I'm getting five and six over offers over ask. I mean, we, we just had a condo on 85th by 5th Avenue, a one bedroom, 1.2. And we got five over five offers over ask. All cash. So I, um, yes, all cash. So I'm thinking, uh, condos are king right now. Uh, co-ops not so much. And and I agree with what Dan said about Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn is totally on fire. Whatever you put on, like goes. Um, seeing a lot of new construction in the Flatbush area that I think is going to be really attractive. Um, and um, I just want to get somebody's, uh, you know, a, a, like insight on uh, what, what do you, how do you think the end of Title 42 is going to affect the real estate market in the next month or so? I mean, I, I don't know, so I'm asking, I'm putting it out there, if anyone can give me their opinion on that. Does anyone happen to have an opinion on that now? If not, you can just mention it when it's your turn to go. I'll just see. I'm just looking to see if anyone comes off mute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah. I appreciate yeah, it. No problem, Nomi. Thank you so yeah. much. Great thoughts okay. as always. And again, congrats on the move. Thank you. Um, Antonio, what's going on, buddy? Uh, what do you got for us today? You know, it's such a crazy market that, you know, first I want to, uh, I'm going to go into a store and then I'll give you my score. Uh, it, it, we just, I'm so upset right now because we just made a bid and we went $100,000 over asking. And then the broker loves me so much so that he she goes, you need to go higher. I said, are you kidding me? You know, pre-pandemic, this would have sold for lower than the asking price. And it's at 2.8 million, right, asking price. So we went even higher. We still got beat. So I, I'm not in a good mood. Um, and my, my people are putting down 60%, right? They have over $3 million in the bank. It's a co-op. So I, I would give this this uh, the score at um, six right now. Um, I would have given it a five because there's no inventory and, and prices are still um, uh, stabilizing. But it, it is still there's not a lot of uh, buyers who are pulling the trigger because of all of the the new you know the news the banks and they're being spooked. Uh, it is it is a really tough market, but GDP went up, right? Fed uh, Fed uh, interest rates went up. Um, my team only sales. My team is uh, I have a team of ten people, uh, and and a lot of them are doing rentals. That is where to what that's where you want to go. I mean, it's incredible. We put on the, uh, on the market an eight thousand um, dollar rental. And pre-pandemic, it was 6000 During the pandemic, it was like 5000 It rented in a day. <laughs> it was like, you know, and so it is, I think that's where, you know, when people are spooked, they're just going to rent, right? It, it doesn't matter how much money you have. You're going to rent something for $20,000, $3,000, $5,000.
I think it's up 15, 20% from the last time. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, the sales market right now is in, in a stalemate, right? Um, and again, congratulations, Naomi, and welcome, Dan. Uh, this is Antonio, that's my story. Yeah, thanks, Antonio, I really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Antonio. Uh, so, Caroline Bass, uh, I love I love Caroline because to me she always so sometimes will offer a contrarian view. So I'm very excited to hear your <laughs> contrarian view about how terrible the market. Now I'm just kidding. Um, no, no. Uh, what do you got for us? I mean, I have to say I do feel like maybe I'm doing something wrong because <laughs> <laughs> because I am feeling that all of my listings are really quiet really, really quiet. And even listings where I thought I was pricing them, let's say like 4% below the market and what the other comps were still took over 60 days to get into contract. So um, I am struggling this year. Like I'm, you know, I will be totally honest. My, you know, when I look at my numbers and, and I, and I do think that you know, after 18 years, I'm, I'm pretty good at pricing things out. Um, and I've got listings from 900,000 to 10 million right now. Um, no, I'm sorry, 650,000 to, to 10 million. And, and it is, I am finding it really quiet. I am finding my buyers or I, not really there. Whereas in the past, I was always really buy side heavy. Um, I'm finding it really quiet. When I look at my numbers, I'm down 50% from last year, which I know that it's a different market. And, you know, I mean, listen, the last two years, I mean, nobody, I certainly did not expect that it would remain that way. But I mean, 50% is a pretty big drop off. So I am definitely feeling it. And I feel like the number, I think it's, I think it's a four. I think it's definitely much more of a buyer's market for my listings that I have coming. The offers that I have coming in are significantly less. And um, the buyers that I have are putting in offers that are greatly discounted. And I will say, I mean, I've got listings from, Gramercy all the way up to East Harlem. So I'm kind of, I'm spread out all over. I've got Upper East Side, Upper West Side, downtown, midtown. I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of all over. And um, so I'm seeing different markets of what's happening and, and different price points. And it's just, I don't know, it's interesting. Um, the only other thing that I will say that I'm also seeing with my sellers is when the offers are coming in, my sellers are not particularly motivated to make things happen because we discussed it in the get-go. They said, if we don't get, you know, a price that we want, we're going to rent because we've had the discussion that the rental market is strong. And also they all have really good interest rates on their current mortgages. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they are thinking, well, what's the, I'm, it, the money is so cheap and the monthly is so low that I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna sell if I'm not gonna get my price. And I don't know, maybe I'm, again, like you said, maybe I'm contrarian and I'm not, I, other people are not feeling that or, you know, and I, I'm i telling them like, listen, we're not gonna get traction at this. And, and they're like, let's just try and see. And I mean, the market is clearly speaking and then they're converting over to rentals. So I don't know, it's not. <laughs> well, well, first of all, uh... The reason why I love you and all your clients love you and everyone loves you is because you're brutal honesty. You're not here to just hype up the market. You're just going to tell it like it is, honestly. And and Noah did say that April was cool. And Dan mentioned it as well. So, I mean, there's, there was, there's definitely some drop-off happening. People have to be concerned about interest rates. There's a lot going on right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, but just curious, when you said 50% down, is that yeah. volume or is that total dollars? Like, is that a, a volume uh, number that you're giving? Both. I mean, Both. I, they're, okay. they're intertwined. Like the number of deals that I had done last year at, at this time, like let's call it pending and in contract. The number that I had pending and in contract by this time last year was double what I have this year. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
So that's a big and, difference. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Although last year was some people's greatest year ever, you know. And it was um, mine too. And it was mine yeah, too. And I didn't yeah. expect this year to be like last year, but I I didn't expect a 50% drop off, but what I guess what I'm taking away from this from especially from what Noah said is this sounds like we are just more in a normal stable market and that going forward perhaps I just need to better prepare my sellers that you know this is what you should expect xyz based on what's you know based on what's going on in the market it's just more information to prepare and help manage their expectations but i mean i am curious is anybody else down significantly from last year and you're also so Carol, chime in? Carol, Dan, Carol, go ahead. Jump in here. Yeah, so the first five months of last year were incredible as far as um, transactions. So agents, that carried agents into the third and fourth quarter. Yeah. And then we had our worst fourth quarter in 20 years um, in terms of transactions, which are carrying over to right now. And yeah. agents are feeling it. They're feeling the pinch because you don't have deals that are closing, you know, that happened in November, December, January, and October. Right. Yeah. And now the market is just starting to get back up into sort of normal territory, which we're yeah. not going to start to recapture that until, you know, third quarter, fourth quarter. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Karen, I can speak more when it's my turn, but I agree. You're not alone, girl. <laughs> you are not alone. Uh, no, no, awesome. Uh, Noah, you have something to say. Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to echo what, what Phil was saying to Caroline. You know, you, your, your honesty is just really, truly appreciated. Um, and I miss you dearly um, in, in the field with you. Um, I, you know, the, the market is down, and I had this conversation in terms of volume, in terms of volume, right? We definitely yeah. are down from March. That That's that's definitely happening in the data. Um, and I had this conversation with one of my buddies who is a um, technology officer at um, Akamai Technology, so he's not in our market. And he was mm -hmm. explaining from a stock market point of view, from a, from a housing point of view, his theory is that there's no, there's no, at the margin, there are no sellers. Hmm. And... And what he means by that is there's no math here. There's no desperation. You mm -hmm. have locked into lower rates that have no desire to move. And you have sellers that have certain prices in mind. And if they don't get it, they're just going to not sell or yeah. they're going to tap the rental market. And you hear all of these agents repeating versions of this theory in yeah. their own way. It's not black and white. There's all these different nuances to this idea and you're seeing pieces of it from all these agents you don't see it and that's defining this market and i think what you're seeing right here is maybe sellers are just saying no and buyers are saying no and sellers are saying no and maybe what we're seeing is the the widening of the bid ask spread in real time mm -hmm. since yeah my opinion, nothing changed in mid-march yeah thanks guys thanks awesome good, awesome comments a great discussion yeah great discussion guys uh, well, now we'll have John Pascarello, the mortgage banker, settle all of this. Uh, John, so you've been doing <laughs> mortgages for a very, very long time. We'd love to know where do you see this all shaking out as far as mortgages go? Where, what's going on with interest rates? I guess the, the word on the street is they maybe did their last raise, last interest rate raise for a while. There may be this pause. Uh, there's just so much uncertainty, I feel, out there. What are you seeing as far as mortgages go? Um, yeah, there, there, there is definitely a lot of uncertainty, um, and we're not really, we're not really getting any help, right? We had the banking crisis last month, uh, several banks failed as we know, and that did shake buyers, uh, confidence in, in, in financing. Um, it also caused lenders to become more conservative. So on the, on the larger jumbo portfolio loans, they're, Rates are actually a little bit higher now as a result of that. So we're going to have to wait for that to come back as confidence is restored in the system and, and banks uh, become more willing to put a risk on posture again uh, with respect to interest rates. Um, you know, and, and there, there, aren't, there aren't too many things that are immediately helpful, right? I would say most of the things are still headwinds. Inflation remains uh, very steadily entrenched. Uh, it was kind of interesting that the inflation number yesterday was practically identical to the prior month. So it was 0.4% uh, month over month core inflation and 5.5% year over year. It was, it was nearly identical to the prior. So 
it's there's just no clear indication is it getting better is it going to go down or you know is it going to just stick there and and will the fed have to do more we just we just don't know um at the same time you know at the lower end you also have some challenges for buyers which is as of may 1st uh fannie and freddie rolled out new what are called loan level pricing adjusters which are the adjusters that uh, if you look at if you look at a rate sheet, there's sort of a matrix, and at every loan to value ratio, 60 to 60, uh, 65, 70, 75, 80, uh, there's a, a corresponding credit score, and then there's an adjustment penalty. Uh, the higher you go on the LTV scale, and the lower the credit score, the more the penalty goes up. Well, the the government decided to make it a little bit easier for uh, buyers with very low credit scores, say those below 680 to purchase. And they're, they're not the majority of purchasers, but um, they had some pretty hefty penalties. So those penalties were reduced at the expense of people who are more in the middle range of, of the credit score. So someone, for example, putting down uh, 20% with a 750 credit score, their rate's about an eighth higher now. Um, mm -hmm. People who, they also introduced top tier credit scores. So they raised the best credit score you can have for a Fannie Freddie loan from 740 to 780. If you have a 780 or better, you're pretty much unaffected. In fact, things got a little bit better even, very slightly. But if you're in that 720 to, to 760 range, things got a little bit worse. Not too much, but you know, an eighth higher in this market where, where buyers are already extremely rate sensitive. It's just, it's not helping. Um, the other thing that I don't know if, I don't know to what extent everyone's aware of it, but even further back earlier this year, late last year, Fannie Freddie introduced pretty onerous second home pricing adjusters. So now if you have someone who's looking to do, let's say a small pied-a-terre purchase uh, you know, in the city, they're looking at, even with a 30% down payment, they're looking at paying over one and a half points on the loan. Uh, as lenders, we always try to get to no points by lifting the rate to absorb the points, but there's there, there becomes a point where the economics sort of break down and you can't lift the rate anymore. So I've had conversations with certain pied-a-terre buyers where I'm like, look, you're, you're putting down 25%. It's actually over two point penalty. So the best I can do here is, you know, like a 6.75 paying a point. And it's a, it's a real problem. Um, you know, it just, it's, it's turning off just, it's another, it's not like the core market segment, let's say small pied-a-terre buyers, but it's just another thing um, I would say another, another dent in the picture, um, of, of more challenges to buyers. So I feel like, I feel like buyers are getting squeezed. They're not seeing, um, you know, as we, as was just mentioned, most people have rates, um, that are very low. So if they're looking to trade up to something else, they're looking at going from three to six. I actually saw an article recently, I think it was in the wall street journal. It showed a distribution. Uh, of the number of millions of mortgages in each in each category, you know, two and a half to two seven five, two seven five to three, and the vast majority, it looked like a bell curve. And the, the most folks have uh, mortgages in the in the threes, particularly in the low threes. Uh, I think the biggest band was like three and a quarter at like eight million mortgages. So the vast majority of people, um, you know, there there were only actually a, a few million people in the entire country that still have rates above five. Uh, so it's a, it's a very real thing that people are looking at. Well, if I even if I just do a lateral trade uh, into the same price point or go slightly up, my my mortgage payment will be forty percent higher based on the based on the exact same loan size. So if I have to take a bigger loan for a new place, now I'm now I'm really uh, increasing my payment. And I and of course prices aren't down enough to compensate for that, not nearly enough. So buyers are in a tough uh, situation, uh, and and we're also seeing more. Board turndowns too, as Naomi mentioned, we're definitely feeling that. It's so interesting. Thanks, John. It's so interesting because you'd think that the prices maybe, like you mentioned, that the prices have not really changed yet. Um, and that's probably because sellers aren't moving because the interest rates, which is what's keeping the inventory so low, which is keeping prices from not going down more. You know, it's like, it's just this weird cycle where it just like, it just seems like, I don't know how we get out of it. Like you'd think when interest rates come down this much, well, sorry, when interest rates go up this much, prices should come down. That's how it's supposed to Can work. Can I add to this? You know, but yeah, please. Okay, so the important part of what John is saying and what you're saying, I want to add to it, which is because yeah. the rents are so damn high that it is forcing actually some buyers to get out there in the market, at least on the levels that I'm seeing. 
the and the corollary to that is also pandemic pricing is over. That means the pandemic leases are also over. So some of the rent hikes that people are getting are forcing them out into the market as well. So we have like a massive stew of all these things going on at once. Totally. Thanks, Scotty. Uh, thanks so much, John. Does anyone have any questions for John just while we have him? Antonio, did you have something to say? No. Okay. I just thought you were off mute for a second. Um, all right. Great. Thank you so much. John. Oh, go ahead, Tracy. Do you have something? Oh, or God, just I was just doing that. Yes. <laughs> awesome. 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 Sorry. 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 Yeah. So thanks so much, John. We may get back to you a little bit later. So Tracy, what's going on? Um, it's so always good to see you. Likewise. What are you thinking? What are you seeing thanks out there? For yeah, what are you seeing I, out I do there? just what? want to do um, a shout out to Dan Marillo, my favorite from many, many years. It's great to have you on the panel. Hope this will be a regular thing. And as always, I uh, love hearing from my esteemed colleagues. It is so interesting. Um, Caroline, I actually had the best, one of my, my best years, 2014 was actually my very best year in 20 years, but last year came very close second for the first three quarters. And then sadly, I was still so busy. It took me far longer than it should have done to realize that everything had come to a screeching halt Q4. So um, that was interesting. And I have to say that while this year has not been at the same rapid fire pace in New York, I do still have very um, busy book of business in South Florida, where I'm also a broker, as most of you guys know. Um, so that has slowed from the insane level to still very, very strong. But here in New York, actually, I'm so blessed that it has picked up significantly uh, starting in January from what the end of last year was. So I am seeing on the I'm seeing kind of a, a tale of two markets in that, well, certainly Manhattan, Brooklyn, Manhattan, I would say six to seven now, and Brooklyn 10 to 12, without a doubt, I put a two bedroom, two bath condo walk up building on the third floor, no private outdoor space, um, under 900 square feet. And we got over ask within two weeks, multiple offers, bidding war. I need more Brooklyn listings. My New York listings are also sitting and it's a, the kind of the same variety of pricing and location co versus condo, which has been very interesting because working with buyers, especially with new development, I am seeing, um, I, I have a very good friend from university who had a lot of apartments literally sold out from underneath him at the Madison house. So we made a, a, a very nice offer for the last one bedroom left on a higher floor, much more money than he wanted to spend, but he's getting it because he wants to be in the building and the lower floors literally sold out from underneath him in a day. You can't make this up. This is a, a new development from 2019. And I'm seeing that in a couple instances. So it, it's, it's really, it's interesting buyer seller and and on the rental front, you're saying a terrible market, but it depends on from whose perspective, right? For landlords, this is amazing. So that's, <laughs> so that's my, that's, and you know, I will just say the, the one other thing, um, Naomi, congrats again on your move to Corcoran. It's amazing. Um, I have no idea about Thank you. Title 42, of course. Um, you know, today's the expiration, right? I mean, I, I have I'm no idea how that's going to impact had any insight. the cities. Um, no, it's, it's a very valid question. And then there's also the ruling about the renters and not being able to, you know, landlords having potentially difficulty evicting. I mean, there, there's lots of fun things coming out of Albany and then the national government. So I, I, I wish I had my crystal ball. It's going to be continue to be interesting this year is my prediction. And don't forget Local Law 18. Are you familiar with that one? Yes, it's all that's, it's all happening. That's Wait, the uh, Airbnb it? one. Oh, what about it? Oh, so the, the uh, pretty strict law, it's a new law where now buildings have to actually register with the government if that building is going to allow rentals under 30 days. And and if not, you know, so basically Airbnb essentially has to make sure that a building is on this list, this approved list first. So it's a way for owners to now finally have some kind of say as to whether people can Airbnb in their buildings it's, it's interesting because even on lease break we're getting all these people that used to post on airbnb mm. that are like i'm not i'm not dealing with this anymore and they're, and they're starting this that's that's actually how we got uh, to be so aware of it but it just i guess just in the last month or two it's called local law 18. i'm not mad about it phil and i will also say that's actually been the case in miami you have to have if you are, are doing um, a rental for 30 days or less you have to have like a, a registered hotel license as an individual not even at the building level so um they're really cracking yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's similar to that. I think that's where they got the law from. They they kind of borrowed something from came states. from Florida to New York. 
<laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh let's not even go there tracy all right so um william bowles what's going thank you so much tracy let's now go to william bowles would love to hear your thoughts on the market what number you give the new york city market and yeah what do you have for us hey good morning everybody um so but just a comment as if, as if they could make it harder to do airbnb in the city i guess they're trying to do that anyway um <laughs> so so like tracy i work in two markets um i am in i am in connecticut um rural connecticut and then also in new york city um uh i my my dear friend caroline we used to sit next to each other in the office at corker and i i am going to be in your camp my friend it has been the new york market has been a challenge for me this year i actually was just saying to my husband that 19 years in, this is probably the toughest market I have sold in in, uh, in New York City. Um, thank God I have a second uh, sales pipeline because Connecticut um, continues to outperform the city. All my friends that sell in Westchester are saying the same thing. I had a very good friend who sells in Rye and Maranek in that area, and she said that it is crazier than 2020. And wow. all of that is all of that is just super low inventory. Um, it, it just specifically with regards to the city, my, my experience, just a couple of, of, of anecdotes, my experience is that everybody wants the same thing. That's always and forever, right? Um, but I think it's especially heightened now, which is why we're hearing stories of some folks who are having buyers lose out on the multiple bid situation. And then other folks who have listings, you know, that, that, that just get, aren't getting much traction. It's because it, when you have less of a buyer pool, I think they're, they're, they're all going for the same things for whatever reason. Um, I think the other thing that I've been struggling with this year is, is, you know, having conversations, having plans for people to list and then, and then for a variety of reasons, they don't list. Um, examples are a couple of examples are moving to the suburbs, can't find what they want back to that sort of like inventory so tight, right. And just, and just so little movement that they just, they just have to hold on for another year. Or I had someone who literally took a job that she really wasn't that excited about because she's like, well, at least that buys me some, some more time to stay in the city. So, so <laughs> from a, from a business perspective and my business being down in the city, especially on listings, I've just sort of been deemed in multiple ways with, with, with folks who were planning to list. Like we even, I even photographed the apartment. Like we got that far and then suddenly <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, we're not going to do it. Um, <laughs> The, the, the struggle for me too is, and I wonder if anyone else has sort of, maybe I'm, maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way, but you know, I, I have several potential seller clients who are basically saying, call me when you think it's the time and then I'll do it. And I just don't feel like it's, I just, I feel like I'm going to be setting us all up to fail if I'm telling them <laughs> it's the time, right? Um, because these are not unique and special properties. These are, these are, you know, these are one bedrooms. These are, these are things with the sort of things on. Anyway, so, so that's sort of my, that's sort of my take um, um, as best as I can explain it. Uh, outside of the city it just seems to be crazy and, and spring full on. I guess last, last note, my, I feel like, and I, I think Noah alluded to this, or, or maybe Dan alluded to this a little bit. I feel like we're going to have that spring market and we're all going to be like singing a different tune. I just think it's really late this year for some reason, but I, the pent up demand has to come out somewhere. Everyone just can't stay where they are. We know that. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Awesome. Uh, no, thanks, no, William Antonio. Do you have a comment? Yeah, no, the, that was really a great thing, William. Thanks for being so transparent in what you're going on. You know, in your market in, in Connecticut and in New York, the thing with listing, this is what I find that what really works. It depend, depends on their motivation. If somebody owns an apartment in New York that's $3 million or more, more than likely they have another home, they really don't need to sell. And what engenders trust is when I say to them, this is not the time to buy, but they rent it out. Um, we're about to get uh, a, a $10,000 rental in um, Park Slope and another one down in the Lower East Side, uh, one for $8,000, one for $10,000. And they sent us referrals, buyers, um, their friends, because we engendered their trust by saying, this is not the time to get your aspirational pricing and they don't need to sell. So. Yeah, you may not get the listing, but you'll get referrals and you get their trust. And it, unless it's special, like you said, 
uh, it's not going to sell. And unless it is in mint condition, the one that, that I'm still upset about, because I don't usually get upset, as you all know, I'm very positive, but it, it is, it was beautiful. I mean, the, the, the oven itself is like a Lamborghini. It's just, it's just the, the most beautiful renovated property I've seen. And that's just rare in, in this market. Uh, so, you know, it, it is it's all about relationships, right? We keep saying that over and over again. But in this uh, low volume transaction and sales, uh, I think how, how we work it as brokers is really to keep working on relationships. I just wanted to add that. And thank you, Thanks, John, Antonio. For incredible mortgage report, by the way. I really Antonio, by the way, you have a lot of background noise. I don't know if there's a way to reduce it. I mean, we can hear you, but it's I'm, very faint. So just a, just a heads I'm up for you to right comment now, again. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks a lot, Antonio. Uh, okay, uh, could you guys hear me? Okay, yeah, great. Uh, oh, guys, yes, Scott. Okay, sorry. I thought I just turned off my uh, my phone for a second. Scotty, don't make a boomer comment again about me. Anyway, yep. Uh, Scott Harris <laughs> in the house. How's it going, buddy? We'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on the market and what number you'd assign to it and all that good stuff. Hey, Phil. Um, thanks for having me back. It's been a been a minute. Um, and I, I'd like to think it's it's that reason I haven't been back because it, the market's been so active. Um, so I will dive right in. Um, I have a, a few thoughts on what people have said, you know, the benefit of listening to everybody go before me. Um, agree on the rental market, you know, very much. The only thing I'd add to that is that I've actually seen that there's a little bit of a shift kind of paradigm wise that a lot, a lot of renters are expecting no fee apartments. And so, you know, renters and should are expecting that and landlords should really just raise their prices and, and market it as no fee in order to really garner the most, um, the most, the broadest amount of potential tenants. I mean, that would be my recommendation in a lot of situations. Um, Brooklyn, we didn't see that uh, with some recent stuff, but definitely in Manhattan. Um, on the sales side, um, I would, I would say that just mention that we had the best quarter we've ever had as a team ever in 20 years this past quarter. So, I mean, I, I would really attribute that to uh, a market where sellers are a bit more realistic on their pricing are willing to, um, to come down a bit or price their apartments really at market levels. Uh, and if, if anything is slow, it's because either it came on and we just weren't sure how to price it. And so we're really trying to find the right level or sellers are reluctant to reduce their prices. Um, and so, you know, the market feels very liquid to me. A lot of buyers are out in the marketplace and making offers. Um, and, and I've been very public about this. The smart money at the, at the luxury end of the market is, is pulling the trigger. You know, there's there, they see value everywhere. Um, I actually was on a panel yesterday at city field and, um, a, a bank focused on, you know, focusing on catering to foreign buyers said that o a quarter, a full quarter of all of their mortgage origination was happening um, with foreign buyers, which was an astonishing number. That's across the U.S. So, look, if, if the world believes that New York is, uh, is strong and coming back and there's value here, I think we should, too. And I think it's showing in the market. Um, so I, I, I'm not as... I'm, maybe I'm just not that big a fan of great inflation, Phil, in terms mm -hmm. of signing all these numbers. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that it is so price driven. Um, I wouldn't just say, hey, it's a buyer's market. Hey, it's a seller's market. I actually think deals are happening because sellers are adjusting their prices down. And so in that way, I, I think on some level, it's it's still a buyer's market. Um Maybe so a full, a, like a four a, kind of is what you're thinking. Yeah, it's like a four. I mean, the way I put, I think about it is that pricing, and I'm putting Brooklyn to the side because yes, you know, we're just not, our business is not focused as much on Brooklyn. But in Manhattan, if you're overpriced, it's crickets. And if you're mm -hmm. priced right, it's like lots. I mean, we've had things going to get accepted offers at the ask for all cash in like a day. And we've seen a number of properties from, 600,000 to three and four and five million dollars go, you know, very quickly if they're priced right. Um, and, and but if you're overpriced or you've just missed the market or 
um, that then I would assign it, you know, I would, you know, I, I just warn sellers, you cannot overprice your apartment. It's like the kiss of death. Um, mm -hmm. I want to add one thing which people haven't really talked about here. And Noah, maybe you can, you know, weigh in on this. The I really want to address renovation and unrenovated apartments because from my perspective, we are seeing like a mate, like a paradigm shift in the value of apartments that are unrenovated. And what I mean is that I can look into a building and say, okay, based on the last 10 years, properties of this size and this line, meaning like the same apartments in a particular building are selling around plus or minus this level. If they're renovated or unrenovated, you can kind of look and see. Now, the renovated apartments are kind of holding value to a certain degree, but the unrenovated apartments are taking like a 10% plus hit. Um, because people are extraordinarily concerned and really, frankly, just the cost of renovation is, has gone up so much and it's finally really hitting and uh, hitting reality and sellers are not thrilled. You know, we're, we're negotiating with a seller on the West side and the average sale price of that unit is, has been like three, eight. And now that unit is probably going to trade around three, three. Mm. And it's not like we're trying because the market is, um, is horrible. It's just because the cost of renovation there has made, has brought down the value. So I, I'd love to kick that around with people and see if they're seeing the same thing, because it is definitely impacting people's valuation um, as they go to as, for buyers as they go to look to make offers. Uh, no, hey, thanks, John. God. Noah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, John put a piece out there um, specifically on this renovated versus unrenovated, and you know it was tricky, you know. Um, doing the methodology for this and defining the data sets he had to go into keyword searches and and certain varying aspects of keywords to define what's renovated and what's not um but he came up with a nice chart and and look i, I don't have the updated data in front of me because i didn't expect this topic to come up i i'm looking at until um august of last year um that's all i see here he didn't update it since then and and the spread is wide the spread is wide and and i'm sure it it, it didn't narrow over the last um, six, seven months. And I mean, you know, you consider labor and you look at, you look at, um, j just, just getting labor, forget, forget even, um, the prices of things. I mean, you know, the price of lumber has come down. It was much higher, you know, five, six months ago, you know, things are, are disinflating a little bit, but there's some sticky entrenched inflation still in there. And, and the, the psych, the psychology of it is another variable that we can't measure you know the the damage is done people are just tightening up when it comes to renovations so i think that that buyers are are quite simply just what i said is a hundred percent correct buyers are bidding up for renovated apartments that do not require the need to to hire somebody and buy materials and labor to do the renovation and time and opportunity cost and they are bidding down for units that require those things. And that environment is probably gonna stay like that for a little while longer. It's a very, very, very good topic. Excellent point, Scott. Awesome, thanks, Scott. Um, thank you, Scott, so much for your thoughts. Before we get to Nikki, William, did we ever get a number out of you for New York City? I can't remember. I don't know if you're still- uh, um, <clears throat> I'll give you a very boring five, how's that? Oh, perfect, William, perfect. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, uh, thanks again, Scott. And Nikki, so good to see you. I don't like you being on the end like that, Nikki. Usually right in the, in the beginning. What happened? Anyway, uh, we'd love to hear from you and what your thoughts are on the market. What happened is sort of like I'm in the middle of a bidding war on my <laughs> rental. So every time I turn around, there's some new twist and turn. Um, you know, this is a very sort of strange market. I think my year started out pretty good. And then I want to say like the last six to eight weeks have been a little weird. Um, I think by buyers, my buyers have been rather, rather nervous. Um, the, the transactions that I do have sort of slowly piecing together are all people who have a definitive need to transact, whether they're selling here to buy something in the suburbs or they're selling here to then, you know, buy something larger. Everything has a, a need element to it. 
and everybody else is kind of like, well, you know, I don't know, I think I might want to sell or I think I might want to buy, they're on the sidelines. But if the perfect thing came up, they are like ready to pound. But that inventory crunch is really an issue. And like rentals, this is like, I am losing my mind with this uh, rental that I put on the market just like a week, I guess 10, day, 10 or 11 days ago. We were finally able to show on Monday, and I currently have two people sort of fi fighting and battling over it, and we're going to get well over the past price, <laughs> which is already well over the price that we put this on for. I think we put it on a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we put this on last year, one bedroom on 37th and 1st for 3600 it's on the market now for 4200 and we have a couple of people fighting with uh, potential bids and interest over the asking price. My owner thinks I'm a genius. <laughs> he's like, he's like amazed. He's like, I can't believe this. Um, and I told him, I, this is, this is the, the nature of the market right now. And he kind of wishes he had bought a second, another apartment when I suggested to, it to him when he bought this one. But, you know, we shall see. <laughs> wow. Well, and, and Nikki, last year, if I remember correctly, uh, the market was pretty crazy last summer. Right? So 3600 3, was probably a good price. So now you're at 4200 Last year, I wasn't even sure I would get 3600 and we got above 3600 <coughs> I put it on at 42 I was like, well, you know, let's see what happens. And it's it's bananas. It's bananas. I just, I can't even explain it. 37th first. I would never have thought this. Um, but... I think that it's just, there's a lot of uncertainty. People are very, very nervous. People are nervous about their jobs. People are nervous about the economy. But the people who definitely need to do something, those are the people that those deals are happening with. And that's what's happening in, in my business. So I'm kind of prioritizing the people who have really definite needs and then sort of bucket B is the people who would, <laughs> if something came up that's perfect, you know, we'll make it happen. <laughs> Zicky, get some water. Are you okay? <laughs> Drink I'm, lots I'm of dying. water. I'm dying in the street on Park Avenue. <laughs> um, wonderful. So thank you so much for those thoughts, Nikki. Anyone have any other comments or questions? We're getting to the end of the call. We usually try to end this around 12. Uh, oh, Nikki, did you give us a, a number? I think you might have. Um, oh, no, for the sure. uh, sales market. I'm not sure if I gave you a number. I think, you know... I, some days I'm closer to like a six, a six and a half, and some days I'm sort of squarely in the middle at sort of five, five and a half. Mm -hmm. um, it, like my, my sentiment kind of changes almost on a daily basis. I will say um, separately, <clears throat> I've had a flurry of calls from my international clients over the last mm -hmm. two or three weeks. They're all letting me know that they're coming they're coming to town and they want to go shopping for apartments. Um, so clearly I'm probably not going to be taking a lot of time off in July and August. Hmm. This could be the beginning of like the international buyer coming back. Scotty Scott uh, Scott mentioned that, Scott Harris as Look, well. So they we'll always see. they always work, you know, the international buyer more than any other buyer is so relationship driven. Those people are always working with their trusted advisors in any market, but especially in markets like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good sign. Uh, go ahead, Scotty. Do you have some thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know I had said seven, which was the most optimistic, I suppose. But I wanted to be clear. A lot of my buyers are in Brooklyn. So I think that skews it. Brooklyn is definitely much hotter. I think that's also due to lower maintenance and taxes and all of that. So that factors in. Manhattan's definitely slower, but there's still a lot of activity. I also do want to say, just anecdotally, since I've been on both the buyer or seller side and also the renter and landlord side, there's a lot of people moving here from all different parts of the country. So whether it's from the South, from North Carolina, from Florida, from uh, California, and that is a testament, again, I'm going to sound preachy, to how resilient New York City is. Once Broadway came back, I mean, things have been on fire. The restaurant scene is out of control, amazing right now. 
people are understanding the vibe of New York City and people want to be a part of it. And I think that's what's driving some of the enthusiasm, especially on the rental side. Yeah, that's all. But, uh, Scott, I just wanted to just like agree with you 100%. Like, I, I mean, I've been in the city over 20 years and I've never seen the vibe quite like this. It's, it just reminds me of why I love New York City so much. So we're totally back a thousand percent. Um, any other closing comments or thoughts? I or just want to jump yeah. in too. Uh, Philip, that's kind of funny. That's never going to get old to me now. So, Philip. Um, yes. yes. For, but Scotty is Scotty. Scott is not Scott. Um, I completely <laughs> agree. There is a, an energy that has been, you know, I mean, New York has thankfully been coming back bit by bit over the years, but I feel like this spring season, especially, there is an optimism and enthusiasm and excitement. Um, you know, there's still that nasty cheap gunky pot smell on the streets that there wasn't before DeBozo, but that's another conversation. Um, and speaking of Broadway, there's so much good out there, but I just have to, I just saw um, Lynn uh, Miguel, um, Lynn Manuel Miranda's excellent New York, New York last night, just on a whim, not knowing anything about it. And it is a return to old school Broadway and it is fabulous. As is awesome. MJ the musical, if you want to feel like you're going to a good Michael Jackson concert, and Anne Juliet by the creators of Schitt's Creek. So it is ridiculous and funny and wild. What would happen if Juliet woke up and did not commit suicide after finding a dead Romeo? All good stuff on Broadway. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, any other comments from anyone before we uh, look to end the call? Um, I, well, I have yes, uh, some just kind of like clubhouse housekeeping stuff. Um, okay. The, yeah, if, you, if you don't mind. The uh, just a reminder to everybody to follow the house real estate chat. If you were already part of the club, which transferred over to a house, then you're already in here. But if you have a red ticket on your name, then you uh, all you have to do is just uh, accept an invite or, or ask to join the real estate chat house. And also there's an ongoing group uh, chat in the house, which we can kind of post links to upcoming uh, shows like this that we're going to be doing. How's awesome. That? That's great, Scotty. You've been amazing. Thanks for all your help. Scotty's been really helpful in making sure this room runs. Well, I shouldn't call it a room anymore, right? This house runs smoothly, I guess I should say. Um, okay. So everyone, this is an amazing discussion. I also want to remind you, if you want to get a link to future calls or a recording of this call, um, please just tap that above our faces. You'll see like a place to just kind of tap and then you can put your email address in. And I'll make sure I send you a recording of this call as well as let you know about any future calls. This was phenomenal. One of the best discussions we've had, I, I think. Thanks to everyone on the call, everyone in the audience. Thanks to our new panelist, Dan Morello, and to all you amazing panelists. Watch out for emails for the next call. And if anyone has any feedback, you can feel free to uh, let me know. Until next time, feel free to come off a mute. Say goodbye. I love you all. Goodbye. Thank you bye, so everybody. much. Always bye. 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 Bye.